All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to day 11 of introductory physics. We are almost halfway through the class. Uh, so woohoo, good job hanging in there. Um, and today we are gonna be going through a couple of different examples on um, how to apply Newton's laws in various situations. So I hope you guys have a calculator handy because there are some problems that I want you to try along with me. And um, let's get going. I wanted to start off before we dive into all of these examples with um, how like a good problem solving strategy, how to think through these uh, Newton's laws scenarios to, uh, I guess, make it the most logical for solving these problems. So again, we're going to go by that um, problem solving strategy that was outlined in the book way back in chapter one, identify, set up, execute, and evaluate. Um, but specifically for these types of problems, we want to um, identify any keywords in this scenario that might indicate equilibrium, where our net force is equal to zero. So look for those phrases like at rest, constant velocity, constant speed, terminal velocity, uh, those sorts of things imply that there's no acceleration of this object. And if there's no acceleration, then there's no net force. So that can really simplify the problem if we know that it is in an equilibrium kind of situation. Uh, the next thing that you want to identify is the number of objects that are interacting in the scenario. So yesterday we had an example where we had two blocks sitting on a table. Uh, so not only were the two blocks interacting with each other, but the blocks were also interacting with the table. Uh, and also the earth was pulling on both of those blocks. Uh, so you want to try to think through all of those things that are interacting. If there are more than one object in the scenario, you'll need to use Newton's third law. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And then we want to determine the target variables, what it is that we're actually looking for. So that could be the size of a force, the components of a force, it's X and Y components, what direction the force is acting in, or the acceleration of an object. Those are the most common questions that you would be asked about this kind of scenario. When we set up the problem, first of all, I recommend that you draw a sketch of the scenario you don't have to be a beautiful artist to draw a sketch of the scenario. Um, nobody's going to judge you. And my, let me just let me just say, my giraffes look very much like llamas, and uh, my high school physics students thought that was hilarious. So um, you know, if you have to draw a llama-shaped giraffe, then go for it. Uh, but draw a simple sketch of the scenario showing the dimensions and the angles that your forces might be acting in. And then separately draw a free body diagram for each object that's in this scenario. So remember, a free body diagram shows all of the forces that are acting on a particular object and the directions and magnitudes of those forces. So we know gravity is going to be pulling down on things while we're on Earth. We want to draw a gravity arrow pointing down because that's the direction that it's acting in. Uh, so think through those things. And you know, it's always recommended that you draw a separate free body diagram than your simple sketch of the scenario, just so you don't get confused with things like tabletops or floors or walls. Uh, those sorts of things don't need to show up in your free body diagram, just the forces that are acting on your object. Um, we also do not want to show in a free body diagram the forces that are exerted by the object on something else because that would be a separate free body diagram for that other object. So for each force that you're thinking about drawing, ask yourself, what other object causes that force? And if you can't answer that question, then it might be because that force is not a real force. Um, or it's not actually present in the scenario. Um, and you'll see that as we go through some of these examples in a few minutes. 
And then last, choose a set of coordinates and pick which directions are positive and which are negative. Keep it consistent. Again, usually we'll say up and right are positive, down and left are negative, but you can change that for your scenario if that makes it make more sense for you, as long as it keep it consistent throughout the whole problem. So if the object is at rest or sliding on a flat surface, usually it's easiest to make your coordinate axes uh, parallel and perpendicular to the surface. And that holds true even if we're on a ramp or something where our surface is tilted. It's going to be easiest for you to make your coordinate axis like this is the y and this is the x, even though that's not what we're more comfortable with, right? Usually we would say like this is x and this is y. But when we have something up on an angle like that, up on a ramp, um, that's actually less convenient because that means we would have to break down more forces into their x and y components. Whereas if we choose this to be y and this to be x, then we only have to usually break down one force into its components. And we'll do some examples like that tomorrow uh, when we talk about friction. Okay. Next step is to execute the problem. Uh, we want to find the components of each force if we have a force that's acting on an angle. And uh, remember that while the magnitude of a force is always positive, the components of that force can be either positive or negative. So keep in mind, SOHCAHTOA, use those trig identities to help you know which trig function to uh, use for your y component and your x component. Usually we'll use cosine for x and sine for y, but that's not always the case. So that's why it's really helpful to draw a picture um, so that you don't make an incorrect assumption for those. And then the book says it can help to draw a wiggly line through any force vector that you break down into its components so that you don't accidentally um, include that force twice in your math. Um, so just like when you're drawing these things on paper, if that helps you remember, oh yeah, I've already broken down that force, just put a line through it so that you know not to include that in your math. Next step is to set the algebraic sum of all the x components of force equal to zero, if you have equilibrium, right? Because in equilibrium, acceleration is zero. So F equals MA would mean all of your forces add up to zero. Or you would set it equal to MAX if it's in non-equilibrium. And then separately, you would do the same thing for all of your Y components, setting it equal to zero if it's in equilibrium or equal to MAY if it's not equilibrium. But we never want to combine X and Y components into the same equation. If there are two or more objects, you would do that same set of steps for each object that is in this scenario. And if the two objects are interacting with each other, remember Newton's third law relates those forces to each other, equal magnitude and opposite direction. And then you want to make sure you have as many independent equations as the number of unknown quantities. So if we are trying to solve for three different forces, then we need three different equations. And then we would solve these equations to obtain the target variables. So let me pop over real quick <coughs> to the chat because I see we have some questions. When we talk about splitting force vectors, we already have talked about that. We talked about that back in chapter one with our, um, our vector topic, but you'll also see it in examples that we go through today and tomorrow. Um, and then Colby, I'll address your question in a little bit. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, losing my voice. Next step, evaluate. You wanna look at your results and ask yourself if they make sense. Uh, so, first of all, check your signs. If a force is pointing down, then your answer should be negative if that's how you've chosen your coordinate system. Um, 
And if the result is a formula, then think about any special cases that you could plug in to check your, um, check your formula, see if you get correct or logical numbers. Okay, <clears throat> any questions about this problem solving strategy before we see it in action? All good. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. Okay. So I want to start out with giving you a chance to think through this question first yourself, and then I'll ask you some questions about it that will go through the math together. So here in this scenario, we have a box that has a mass of seven kilograms. And you can see there in the picture in the corner, we're pushing on it with a force of 10 newtons at this angle of 45 degrees. So, what is the acceleration of the box in the y direction? Take a second, think about it. What is the acceleration of the box in the y direction? Go ahead and type your answer in the chat when you think you have it. I'm seeing a zero and I'm seeing the sign of 10 newtons. Hmm. So it's kind of a tricky one to think about right off the bat, but we don't actually need any math at all to answer this question. We just need to think about what's happening in this situation. So just like imagine this in your head or if you have like a box or a calculator or something handy that's sitting on a flat surface like you can actually do this if you push down on something at an angle will it fall through the table probably not unless you have a really weak table or you're super strong um not that i'm doubting any of you but anyway uh, so it doesn't fall through the table, but it also isn't propelled up into the air when we do that. So it's not moving in the y direction. Sure, you might be able to slide it in the x direction, but you won't be able to move it up or down in the y direction. And so for that reason, the acceleration is zero. Right? If not, if it weren't zero in the y direction, it would be launched up into the air or fall right through the table. Okay, next question. What forces are acting in the y direction? Take a moment, think about it. What forces are acting in the y direction? All right, I'm seeing some people answering. We got from, uh, there we go. Oh, lost it. Okay, normal force and force of gravity. Also the Fy component and its counterpart. Good. The normal force, yep. Gravity, the force of the push in the y direction. Good, yeah, you guys are on a roll now. Uh, so we have three forces that are acting in the y direction. Gravity pulling it down, of course, because this is happening on Earth, we're assuming. Okay. The normal force of the table pushing it back up. But then also some of that applied force is uh, in the down direction. Some of it is to the side, but some of it is down. Uh, and so we have to consider that as one of our y direction forces as well. Is the magnitude of the normal force equal to mass times g, or equal to the force of gravity in this case? 
Mm, let's think. Gabriel, if it's not moving, then yes. Okay, interesting answer. Wait, isn't always yes? Ooh, it is not always yes. It's the negative of that, isn't it? Equal and opposite. So you guys have some really good thoughts. And um, I would say that you're completely right, except for that third force, that force of us pushing down at an angle. So it is not equal to just gravity in this case, right? Because the table has to withstand not just the weight of the block pulling down, but also the force of your hand pushing down at that angle, right? So the, the table has to withstand both of those two forces. So our normal force is not just equal to gravity. It's equal to gravity plus that other additional downward force that we're applying onto this block. Does that make sense? And we'll do the math for that in just a moment. I think I have one more question that I want you to think through first before we get into the numbers. Okay, what does the free body diagram look like for this? scenario. I want you to take a second, um, try to draw it on a piece of scrap paper or draw it in your mind. What do you think this free body diagram looks like? All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this together. So here's our box and I drew in our uh, coordinate axes, well the x-axis first of all. So we know that the force of gravity is going to be pulling it down. And we know that the normal force is going to be holding it up. But then we also have that um, down and rightward force that we're applying onto it. FA is applied force. And that's at that 45 degree angle. Usually though, we don't like to draw forces pointing at the object. We draw forces pointing away from the object like this. So I'm just going to move that applied force arrow down. It's still that same direction. It's just we took it and we slid it down so that now all of the forces are pointing out of the box. And that just kind of helps us uh, visually remember that um, our y component is negative. Because if we look at it like this, it's a little bit harder to remember that our y component is negative when it's above the axis like that. Um, but when we bring it down there, it's a lot easier to see uh, we're pushing it right and down, so positive x but negative y. So this is what a free body diagram for this situation would look like. Okay. Uh, so if you got all of those questions correct, good for you. If you did not get them correct, that's totally fine. We'll be going through this a lot. Uh, and we got a question from Joshua. What about the force of friction? You're absolutely right. That is an important thing to, uh, to consider. But um, I didn't include it because I haven't taught you yet how to really calculate with friction. Um, but I should have specified there's, we're ignoring friction. Good catch. No, not your bad at all. That's actually your good, um, good observation. If we were to include friction, um, we'll just talk through it. If we were to include friction, it would be pointing uh, the opposite direction of how this object would move. So when we push on it, it would slide to the right, which means friction would point back to the left. So we'd have a little leftward arrow. Um, directly along the x-axis, so that would be friction. Okay, so now we're going to take this same scenario and calculate some stuff with it. Um, but I wanted to ask you these questions before we do our calculations, because these are the types of questions that you should ask yourself before you do any plug and chug of numbers. Um, thinking through what the scenario is asking, what the movement of the object would be like, what forces are present in the scenario. Uh, 
and how to draw that free body diagram. All of those are things that you should think about before you just start trying to plug numbers into an equation. That's the physics of it. The plug and chug, that's algebra. This is the physics. Anywho, here we go. So what is the acceleration of the box? We know that it is not zero um, in the x direction. We know that it is zero in the y direction, right? We talked through that last slide. But if we want to find out what it actually is, then um, we set our forces equal to mass times acceleration. And we're just thinking about uh, the x direction because we already talked about why there's no acceleration in the y direction. So our net force in the x direction equals mass times our acceleration in the x direction. So I drew in here in the diagram um, some orange arrows that show how to break that applied force arrow down into its components. So we have the x component going to the right and the y component going down. Uh, so we're, we're really interested in that x component of the applied force. So applied force in the x component, that's the only x word force that we have uh, if we're ignoring friction, which I am in this case. If we were not ignoring friction, you'll see what to do with that tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, that x component of the applied force equals mass times our x acceleration. So our x component here, uh, we can see our angle 45 degrees is adjacent to that uh, component that we're interested in. So that's the cosine. So applied force times the cosine of 45 degrees equals mass times our acceleration in the x direction. Our applied force is 10 newtons, our mass is seven kilograms. So once we plug in all those numbers, we get an acceleration in the x direction of 1.01 meters per second squared. And again, our acceleration in the y direction is zero because it's not flying into the air and it's not falling through the table. All right. What is the magnitude of the normal force? Well, we know that it's not equal to just the force of gravity in this case, uh, because there's this additional y component of the applied force that we have to consider. We know how to calculate the force of gravity. It's always going to be the same mass times g, so 7 times 9.8. And that gives us a force of 68.6 .6 newtons. Our y component of the applied force is the side that's opposite our 45 degree angle. So we're going to use the sine of 45 degrees, plug in 10 newtons as our applied force, and that gives us a y component of that force of 7.07 .07 newtons. So those two are just magnitudes of our forces. We know that they're both pointing down. So when we actually plug them into our net force equation, we'll make them negative. But for here, these are just the magnitudes of those forces. All right, so now our net force in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. We know that acceleration is zero. So we have the normal force pointing up, the force of gravity pointing down, and the applied force in the y direction pointing down. So uh, normal force is positive and those other two are negative. So net, uh, sorry, normal force minus force of gravity minus applied force in the y direction equals zero, which means that our normal force equals the force of gravity plus the y component of the applied force. So we add those two forces together and we get a normal force of 75.7 .7 newtons which is not the same as gravity by itself. Any questions, comments about this particular example? All good. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's move on to the next one. Okay. So here's another scenario. I want you to think through this initial question first. The box has a mass of 90 kilograms. Will the box move exactly along the x-axis? Yes, no, or I don't know until I do the math. What do you guys think? Okay, we have a guess. I think it won't. And we have a guess of yes. Mm. No, don't do that. Gabriel, <laughs> bring it on. Wow. All right. Alan, not exactly, but it will move in the X direction. Okay, that's that's a good guess. Maybe not exactly along the axis, but in some way in the extraction. Good. Okay, um, so I kind of agree with Alan on this and I'm gonna say I don't know exactly until I do the math, um, which I know kind of seems like a cop out, but we're doing a sample problem. So of course this was gonna happen. That shouldn't be surprising. We're gonna do the math. Okay, uh, so let's do the math. What direction will it move and at what acceleration? Those are the, the two questions that we're gonna to try to answer from this scenario. Uh, so we are kind of saying that this is um, an X and a Y problem. Um, although we're kind of looking at this from like a, a bird's eye view as opposed to um, like a side view. So Y isn't necessarily up off the ground. Um, but we still have those two components that we need to think about. So in X, first of all, um, our net force in the X direction equals mass times acceleration in the X direction. This is one of those kinds of uh, equations that you might want to jot down on an equation sheet. Um, but this is probably like this and maybe the Y direction um, is really the only equation that you would want to write down from these types of problems that we're doing uh, because all of the other equations that we'll be using like this one for example are specific for this scenario we are creating these equations for this particular problem so while you might want to write down this equation on an equation sheet you would not want to write down this one or this one because these are specific for this specific scenario. So just something to keep in mind as you um, go through your normal physics class and uh, have to create equation sheets and things like that. Um, but anyway, we have two forces, both of which have some component in the x direction. And you can see there that um, they've illustrated where our angles are. And for both of them, our x component is adjacent to our angle. So we're going to use the cosine for both of those forces. So force one is 100 newtons, so 100 times the cosine of our angle 60, plus 140 times the cosine of 30. And we're adding those together because both of those forces, uh, we can see, will bring it in the positive x direction. Um, so our mass is 90 kilograms and now all we need to do is find the value for A. So 100 times cosine 60 is 50 and 140 times cosine of 30 is 121 which gives us an x acceleration of 1.9 meters per second squared. Now very similarly in the y direction uh, our net force in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. We have two forces. One is pulling up in the positive y direction. The other is pulling down in the negative y direction. So that's why in this case we have F1y minus F2y, whereas with x we had F1x plus F2x because they were pulling in the same direction. These are the opposite directions. 
So um, our y components are the sides of the triangle that's opposite of our angle, so that's the sine. So 100 sine 60 minus 140 sine 30 equals 90 times acceleration. And once we simplify and do all the number crunching, we get a y acceleration of 0 0.184 meters per second squared. So it's not moving very much in the y direction, but it is moving in the y direction as well as the x direction. Okay. Um, but since it didn't ask us specifically for the components, it asked us for the acceleration, I'm going to take this a step farther and solve for the magnitude of the acceleration. So there we have our components that we just found. The magnitude, we're going to take the Pythagorean theorem, the square root of our x component squared plus our y component squared gives us an acceleration of 1.91 meters per second squared. And our direction, remember we're going to use the inverse tangent of the y component over the x component. So that's the inverse tangent of 0.184 over 1.9. And that gives us an angle of 5.53 degrees. So again, not very much in the y direction, but still significant enough to include. Um, so there we go. Any questions, comments, concerns about uh, this example? Clear as water. Good, I'm glad to hear that. I hope you have clear water, but uh, good. Okay, and again, if you guys have any questions at any point, um, you can let me know in the chat. Uh, you can send me a private chat if you feel more comfortable doing that, or you can ask a question of the whole group. Um, and if there's a question in the whole group that I don't happen to notice right away, um, then feel free to try to help each other out. Okay. Next question, the Atwood machine. Uh, so these are, they kind of look like torture devices a little bit, I think. Uh, hopefully they won't torture your brain too much as you think through these types of scenarios. Uh, but anyway, we have a string that connects two masses going over a pulley. How fast do the masses accelerate? So in this case, we're gonna do this question all in terms of variables because we don't have any specific numbers that we can plug in. Um, so I wanted to show you an example like this where we're doing just variables so that you can see how to check your final equation to see if it makes sense when you don't have any actual numbers. So step one, draw a picture of the scenario. So here we have our pulley and we have two masses hanging off of this pulley. It doesn't specify in the question but I'm going to assume that one mass is bigger than the other. Um, and we'll talk about that assumption, what happens if it's not true in, at the end of the example. So in this case, if mass one is bigger than mass two, then um, our system is going to fall in the direction of mass one. It'll rotate around counterclockwise. Uh, so that's the direction that I set as positive y. Okay, now we want to draw a separate free body diagram for each object. So that's mass 1 and mass 2. Our pulley is not moving, it's not doing anything, so I'm not going to draw a free body diagram for the pulley because nothing's really interacting with the pulley. Um, these two masses are the ones that we're interested in for this problem. So I'm going to represent my mass 1 as a dot. We should know that we have the force of gravity pulling down. So that's um, mass 1 times g. But we also have this string that's holding it up. And so since we're dealing with a string, that upward force is called tension, not the normal force. Right? Normal force is when it's sitting on a surface. Tension is whenever we're involving a string or a wire or a rope or that sort of thing. So our free body diagram for mass two looks very similar. We have the force of gravity pulling down and the tension force pulling it back up. So I drew these to be um, 
approximate sizes because again we don't have numbers to know for sure but if mass one is falling down that means the force of gravity on it is stronger than the force of tension and vice versa with mass two if that mass is going up into the air that means the tension pulling it up is stronger than the force of gravity pulling it down but a cool thing to keep in mind with problems like these is that um, these two objects are connected to the same string and so the tension is going to be the same on that string everywhere meaning that if we can find the tension for one we automatically know the tension for the other one those two are equal so i'm putting that little dash mark on those two forces in our diagrams just to show that they are equal in size to each other i know it's a little bit tough to tell that when they're offset from each other but those two are the same magnitude okay step three we're going to apply newton's second law for each object and each direction separately now this is really convenient because we're only dealing with the y direction we don't have any swinging from side to side uh, so we can totally just ignore the x direction and only think about the y direction so for mass one we have our net force and i didn't even bother to specify in the y direction because again that's the only direction that we have motion in so we're just assuming from here on out that everything is in the y direction so net force equals negative m1 times a why did i choose negative m1 times a there why is it negative because it's going down yes absolutely great great work uh, and that's a key thing that a lot of students will miss when they do types of these types of problems um, you have to remember that one of these objects is going down and one of them is going up so they're going in opposite directions and uh, one of them is going to have to be negative right you can choose down to be positive if you want to but that means your m2 acceleration would be negative because it's going up then in that case okay so um just one of those things don't forget to do that negative because it's accelerating downward okay so the forces that we have on mass one are tension and the force of gravity tension is positive because it's pointing up gravity is negative because it's pulling down so tension minus m1 times g equals negative m1 times a we're gonna bring that force of gravity over to the other side of the equation so that tension equals m1g minus m1a. And then we can simplify that a little bit uh, if we want to, but I'm just gonna leave it like that. For mass two, similar sort of situation, except now acceleration is positive because it's going up. So our net force equals m2 times a positive acceleration. We have tension pulling up minus gravity pulling down. Gravity is always going to be mass times g, so tension minus m2g equals m2a. And now we already know what tension is from mass one. So we're going to substitute in that variable so that we can simplify our equation a little bit. All right, so if tension is m1g minus m1a then we're going to plug that into our equation for mass 2. so our equation becomes m1g minus m1a minus m2g equals m2a so you can see on the left side of that equation we have two terms that both have a g in them so we're going to factor the g um, and that should be an equal sign, not a minus right here. Sorry about that typo. So when we um, simplify our equation after that and solve for the acceleration, then we get a result of 
m1 minus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 times g. And this is our final acceleration equation. It looks a little scary because it's all just variables. Um, and we tend to, at least most people tend to like numbers better than letters in math. Um, so there's that. But it's actually really helpful sometimes to leave our equations like this in terms of variables so that we can uh, check and see if it makes sense. Um, so let's go through some um, specific cases of this and uh, see if we can double check our work. So this is how we will evaluate our answer, right? If m1 is um, if m1 is bigger than m2, then our acceleration will be less than the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, and that should make sense uh, because this object is not free falling, right? There's still the string that's holding it up. So it's not gonna be able to fall as fast as it could if it were just free falling down through the air. Um, and so if mass one is bigger than mass two, um, then mass two is, is gonna slow it down a little bit. So our acceleration will be a little bit less than the acceleration due to gravity. And that's what we see from our equation. Another case, if mass two is greater than mass one, and our initial assumption was incorrect, then our acceleration would be negative. Uh, and so that would make us realize then that our system would rotate the other direction. Um, and so that would kind of uh, just physically make sense um, that if our M2 is bigger than M1, it would fall towards the heavier mass. So our acceleration would be negative because it's rotating the opposite way of our assumption. If mass two were equal to zero, that would be like we completely cut the string. Um, and so both mass two terms in this equation here would disappear because they're equal to zero. And so that would be like saying acceleration equals m1 over m1, which simplifies to one, times gravity. And that should make sense to us too. If we cut the string, above mass one, um, then our mass is gonna free fall and our acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. And then finally, if mass two equals mass one, then um, our, our top of the fraction here, mass one minus mass two, would become zero because those two numbers would be equal. So our acceleration would be zero times g or just zero. And if those two masses were equal to each other, it wouldn't tend to rotate towards one or the other because they're equal to each other. So there would be no acceleration and our object would, I mean, our system would just chill there. Um, so going through all of those different special cases kind of helps us check whether or not our equation makes sense. And in this case it does, so yay, go us. Um, let's see. Do you guys have any other questions about this example other than my typo right there towards the bottom, uh, which I'll fix when I upload this to Canvas? Yeah, I see that comment there. You always set up as negative and down as positive because you see it as it's moving against or with the forces of gravity. Um, that's totally valid. You are welcome to do that. Uh, again, as long as you keep it consistent throughout the whole problem, um, you would end up with the same answers as me, um, even if you had a different coordinate system chosen. Uh, so you do you as long as you keep doing you through the whole problem. <laughs>
Okay. Cool. Not seeing any other questions. Uh, so let's move on. Here is example eight. A car engine with weight W hangs from a chain that is linked at ring O to two other chains, one fastened to the ceiling and the other to the wall. Find the tension in each of these three chains in terms of W. The weights of the ring and the chains are negligible. So I have this as a give it a try example, um, but really I just want you to give it a try the first part and then we'll go through the math of this together. Okay, so I just put the important part of the question in gray up at the top there. But what I want you to give a try is drawing a free body diagram for the engine and the ring. Both of those objects are important in this scenario uh, because there are ropes coming off of both of them. Um, so go ahead, take a minute, draw a free body diagram for each of those objects, and then we'll come back together. All right, so engine first, there's our engine. We have the force of gravity pulling it down. Um, and the force of gravity is equal to its weight. The question is asking us to find the tension in terms of weight, so I'm just going to leave it as W throughout the whole problem. And there's that first chain that's pulling up on the engine, um, making it hang in the air. So tension one, as you can see in that diagram there, tension one is pulling up on the engine, keeping it from falling down. But those are the only two forces that we have acting on the engine. So at this point, our free body diagram is as complete as possible for that object. Um, we know though that um, our engine is not accelerating in the Y direction. It's not falling down. It's not being launched into the air. So we're gonna um, just put those dash marks through our forces to show that they're equal in size. Our, uh, our engine is in equilibrium, it's at rest. So those two forces are equal. For our ring, um, I'm drawing in a coordinate system and I'm doing that because we know that at least one of the forces is acting at an angle. Uh, so we wanna make sure we draw in a coordinate system for that particular force. So we have the tension pulling uh, down on our ring, tension one pulling down. And that is equal to tension one pulling up on the engine. Remember, anytime we have a string or a rope or something like that, um, anytime we're dealing with the tension force, really, if we have two objects that are attached to that same string or chain in this case, uh, then they're both experiencing the same force of tension, just in opposite directions. It's Newton's third law, right? Equal and opposite. Um, so the action force is the engine pulling down. The reaction force is the chain pulling back up. Those two are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So that's how we know that those two forces are equal to each other. We have tension two pulling um, towards the wall, or to the left. And then we have tension three pulling up at that angle. So um, we're going to establish this angle right here to be 60 degrees. Um, this is a geometry kind of, I don't know if you call it an identity in geometry, but um, if you have two parallel lines crossed by a diagonal line, um, then those two angles, the one that's identified in the picture and this one that I identified in the free body diagram are equal to each other. Right, if we were to make this into a right triangle um, so that this angle at the top left would be 90 degrees and this angle down here at the bottom would be 30 degrees, we know that this, um, this angle between our, our axes here, our y-axis and our x-axis is 90 degrees. So if this angle in here is 30, that must mean this big angle here from the positive x-axis to our chain is 60 as well. Hopefully that made sense. Um, 
yeah, it's an identity proof, alternate angles, alternate interior. Okay, cool. Yeah, I um, I didn't take geometry in school, so I I don't know what those phrases are for it, the names. Um, but I'm glad you guys do. So good, <laughs> go you. Okay, but anyway, this is our 60 degree angle here, um, and so we have our free body diagrams done. So just for the sake of uh, simplicity in our calculations coming up, I'm going to just go ahead and write in our uh, components of our tension three. Um, our X component here is tension three times the cosine of our angle 60 because it's adjacent to our angle. And then our Y component is tension three times the sine of our angle because that's the opposite side. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, any questions about those free body diagrams? For those of you who felt a little bit clueless uh, just being thrown into this, does it make a little bit more sense now that you see them? Okay. I hope so. Uh, somewhat. Okay, so um, if you have a specific question about them, feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, but I think, as with most things in physics, the more examples you see of it, the more it will make sense and the easier it will become to do it on your own. So that's why we're doing so many of these examples. Um, but there are some things that we need to calculate. We're not done after the, these free body diagrams because we need to find the tension in each of those three chains in terms of its weight. So to do that, we're gonna apply Newton's second law and I'm gonna look first at the engine because that's the simpler one. It's not moving side to side. It just has forces in the Y direction. Uh, so that one's the easiest to think about. I'm using this notation this time uh, just so we get used to seeing it written both ways. Sometimes you'll see it as the net force in the y direction, like we've done in previous examples. But some professors in textbooks prefer this symbol, uh, sigma, meaning the sum of the forces. So I just wanted to make sure that you see that in action as well. So the sum of our forces in the y direction is tension one pulling up minus the weight pulling down. And we know that this engine is not falling down. It's not being launched into the air. So our acceleration is zero for our engine. It's in equilibrium. So that means that our tension force is equal to our weight. Hooray! We already knew that from our free body diagram over here. Uh, we had drawn in those dashed lines showing that they are equal to each other. So this uh, should not be a surprise just based on this free body diagram that we have drawn. So over here in this green box, I'm gonna keep track of the tensions once we calculate what they are, uh, just because there are three that we need to find um, and they relate to each other. Okay. So that's it for the engine. Um, now let's look at the ring. So thinking about the y direction first, you can do it either way. I just think in this case, the y direction is simpler to think about first. Um, so in the y direction, we have the sum of our forces in the y direction, which is that y component of tension three, T3 sine 60, minus our tension one, and again, it's not swinging side to side. Uh, so our ring is in equilibrium as well, which means our acceleration is zero. So that means that our tension three equals the sine of 60, I'm sorry, tension three times the sine of 60 degrees equals tension one. But we already found that tension one is the same thing as our weight. So that all equals the weight, which means tension three is our weight 
divided by the sine of 60 degrees or 1.15 times the weight. So that's tension three in terms of W. Now we can look at the X direction. So the sum of our forces in the X direction equals our X component of tension three minus tension two pulling to the left. Again, it's not moving anywhere, it's in equilibrium, so our acceleration is zero, which means T3 cosine of 60 equals T2. We know what T3 is, it's 1.15 W. Um, so substitute that in times the cosine of 60 degrees, that gives us T2 to be 0.58 W. And there we have it, our three tensions in terms of the weight w okay do we have any questions about this example I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so we will do uh, one more example together today, and then we'll do Hello, are we back? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know what happened, but something happened. Anyway, let's get back to it. Just blame Gabriel. <laughs> okay, uh, Joshua, can we leave it in terms of sine and cosine? Um, you could, but I would say um, you'll generally want to simplify as much as possible. Um, even, you know, just for the sake of plugging things in, like if we had left um, tension three with the sine and cosine, um, as tension three equals weight over sine of 60 degrees, um, and then we had to plug that in to solve for T2, it just would have made our equation a little bit more gross to look at. Um, but I mean, you could, yeah, if you don't have a calculator, if you like forget you have a test that day and leave your calculator at home or something like that, then for sure, I mean, leave it in terms of sine and cosine if you don't know those um, numbers off the top of your head. Um, which I, I don't, <laughs> so um, yeah. Simplify as much as you can though, is generally the rule of thumb. Okay, um, so let's go through one more example today. Ooh, just kidding, not there yet. Um, our next example is gonna deal with apparent weight and weightlessness. So I wanted to give you a quick little uh, lesson on what apparent weight and weightlessness really mean. So previously we've been referring to weight as the force of gravity pulling down on you, um, which you know when we refer to it as that we'll just call it weight. But there's also something called apparent weight, which is the weight that you feel. Uh, so this is more related to the normal force than actually related to weight, uh, because apparent weight is the upward force that opposes gravity and prevents a supported object from falling. So for example, if you're standing on your bathroom scale to find out how much you weigh, it's actually telling you how much normal force the, the scale is having to push up on you to withstand the force of gravity pulling down. 
So your scale actually measures your apparent weight, not your actual weight. Um, usually they are equal to each other unless the object has an acceleration with a vertical component. So if you're lifting something, um, or if you're in an elevator, or if there's a rocket attached to it, or on a roller coaster, that sort of thing, then your apparent weight is not equal to your actual weight. Or if there's some other force than the Earth's gravity and normal force acting on the object. So like buoyancy, magnetism, centrifugal force, gravitational force from something else, um, all of those things could like interfere in a sense. Um, and so that would change your apparent weight. Right. I mean, if you think about it, like if you have magnetic shoes and then you step onto a big magnet, that's going to be pulling you down along with the gravity that's pulling you down. So that would make you feel heavier as you try to walk across this magnetic surface with magnetic shoes. I'm not sure when you would actually do that in real life, but I mean, hey, you, you live your life. You do you. <laughs> yeah, if you're feeling self-conscious, just weigh yourself on Mars instead. Simple. Or the moon, you know, if you're feeling, if you really want to go on a weight loss plan, so does the moon. Weightlessness happens when there are no contact forces at all pushing up on the object. In that case, the apparent weight is zero. Um, so this would happen to astronauts in space uh, when they're flying around, well, floating around in the International Space Station, um, they feel weightless because there's nothing pushing up on them, um, no normal force pushing back up on them. Uh, you can also feel this, though, when you're like on a swing set and you're at the peak of the swing right before you start coming back down. You kind of like hover momentarily before you start coming back down. Um, so that would be an example of approximate weightlessness. <laughs> oh, I like that. I need to lose mass. You're more attractive with it. I like it. What about the flights that make you feel weightless? That's kind of the same effect, right? Uh, yeah, so there's like the astronaut training flights. Um, they call it the vomit comet. Uh, because they, there's this big, there's this plane with this big open space. Um, and so they take you up really, really high. And then it's just basically like a steep drop down. Um, and so when you are falling, you're falling at the same rate the plane around you is falling. And so um, you can kind of like float around in there like you would in space. Because since both things, both you and the plane are falling, then um, there are no contact forces acting on you. So you feel weightless. Um, and so they, to train astronauts, they do this uh, periodically. And um, yeah, makes you feel weightless. Okay, so before we leave today, we have just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to do this last example with you about apparent weight. So, a 50 kilogram woman stands on a bathroom scale while riding in an elevator, accelerating at 2 meters per second squared. Because who doesn't do that on a normal day to day basis? What is the reading on the scale? Okay, so here's our picture this lady who happens to have a bathroom scale and an elevator. We draw our free body diagram for her. We know that there's the force of gravity pulling down, which is equal to mass times g, so 50 times 9.8 or 490 newtons. We also have the normal force pushing back up, which we don't know the magnitude of. Um, that's what we're trying to find. So if we take the sum of our forces in the y direction, then we have the normal force minus the force of gravity equals mass times r y acceleration. Okay, leaving it in terms of variables for now, um, that means that our normal force equals 
mg, our force of gravity, plus ma. And then we can factor out a mass, get mass times g plus a. So when we plug in our numbers, you would see that the scale actually reads 590 newtons instead of 490 newtons, which we would expect. Right, so this would be like when the elevator first starts moving upward, um, you feel like you weigh a little bit more. Um, okay. If the elevator were accelerating with negative two meters per second squared, what would be the reading on the scale this time? Take a quick second, try to figure it out on your own. Well, let's take a look. Okay, our free body diagram, we still have the same force of gravity pulling down on her because she has the same weight. Like in, in real life, she would have the same weight, you know, she didn't just randomly lose mass. Um, now we need to find the, the normal force again. So we set it up the same way, except now, our acceleration is negative two. So when we plug in our acceleration, we plug in negative two, and that gives a normal force of 390 newtons. Yay! So um, you can feel this yourself. Like the next time you go in an elevator and the elevator starts moving down, you feel a little bit lighter momentarily while it's accelerating downward. Um, same thing when it's lifting you up, you feel a little bit heavier momentarily. Um, and that's because of physics. That's not just an illusion in your brain, that's physics. Woohoo! Um, so that's all I have for you guys today. Let's try with roller coasters. Yeah, you feel the same thing on roller coasters, absolutely. Um, and I agree that is more entertaining <laughs> than riding in an elevator. Um, but anyway. Tomorrow, we will talk about friction and how to incorporate that into these examples. So we'll do some more example problems again um, with friction and on angles and wrap up uh, chapter five. So next week, we'll move on to actually chapter 12 first, uh, and then we'll jump back to chapter six. Um, so I recommend that you bring a calculator along with you tomorrow so that you can do some of these example problems along with me. Um, but as always, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to stick around after I stop the recording. And if not, I hope you guys have a great day uh, and I'll see you all tomorrow.